All right. Um, so this is really just sharing with everyone because I know this is a data management planning interest group. What our journey has been as part of the Australian Research Data Commons Institutional Underpinnings. So I'm hoping that um, we'll have questions as well as opportunities to continue the conversation because ours is just a journey and we know it's going to be a long journey. Um, I'll acknowledge country from where I'm presenting um, in Brisbane, which is Minjin country. Um, so UNESQ would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we gather. We'd also like to pay our respect to elders past and present and emerging. All right, so we got involved in the institutional underpinning projects as one of the 25 universities that are part of that project. Um, the project has advanced in phases. So there was a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three. So what I'll do is just talk about our journey and what we've been able to achieve as well as some of the challenges we've experienced and the learnings. So the aim of our involvement was to implement and enable fair and care principled research practice at UNESQ. And a note there for everyone, we've changed, we've rebranded, so we are no longer USQ, it's UNESQ. Um, so the focus was on research data management planning and active data management. So we had the goals listed there. So one of the goals was to update our research data management framework. And here it's really broadly talking about the framework, what we have in place in terms of resourcing across a university that enables research data management. The other thing we wanted to do was increase the awareness of fair and care principled data management planning and active data management practices by researchers and research support staff. Then we were also looking to enrich data sets that we held so that they were more aligned with fair and care. So we're taking the opportunity during that process to have an impact on the data sets as well. Then um, the other thing, part of the involvement of the institutional underpinnings project was to not only um, gain benefit for our own institution, but to also like um, share learnings with other institutions. And so along with um, QUT, uh, Canberra University and Charles Darwin Uni, we um, are working towards testing what QUT have developed, which I believe there was a presentation in the last RDMP um, interest group on that tool. So we are part of that testing process for the tool. So the approach we took, I'll just speak to this, but then I'll detail, I'll provide more details in the next slide. So we, we kind of took a top-down approach. So what we first did was gain the support at the governance layer. So our research and innovation DVCR, we, we got support from him, and then we worked with um, the, the highest um, decision-making bodies within our university. So what we have is the vice chancellor's um, executive. So we um, prepared material for them on what the plans were around enriching research data management practices within the university. We also got um, the support and endorsement of various research committees. And so the idea was across the university, so wherever research was being undertaken, whether from within the schools or within the research centers, there was awareness about the importance of research data management and some of the changes that needed to be made in research data management practices. So that involved doing a few things such as revising and updating of UNESQ research data management framework, which includes the policies, the processes, and the guidelines. Then um, the increase of that uh, research staff awareness, so getting access to make presentations to staff and um, students as well. So that just increasing awareness across the entire university. 
and not just the users, but the central services teams as well, such as library, ICT services. So bringing everyone al along, cause it's, it's, uh, there are lots of stakeholders and ideas to try and energize the entire base to get that success when it comes to research data management planning. Then there's application and fair and care principles and the learnings from the involvement. So that involved a bit of a piece of academic work where there's a bit of a literature review, understanding what's happening across the other universities as well, being involved in the activities um, that were being run alongside research data management planning across the institutional underpinnings project. Then there was documentation and then the testing of the efficacy of um, the elements that were being developed, uh, the national framework, and some of the tools as well. So what I'll do in this slide is kind of tell the story around um, each project goal, the approach undertaken, the outcomes we've achieved, and the status. So this is kind of reporting where we are at at this point in time. So first goal being updating research data management framework. So um, this involved revising. So in 2014, actually not in 2014, in 2016, UNESCO um, developed a research data management procedure. Actually, it was a policy at that point in time. So we took the opportunity during the institutional underpinnings to revise the procedure and have a really good look at it or rather the plan uh, the policy at that point and have a really good look at it and also look at the other interrelated policies such as authorship policies research code management uh, practice policy so all of those were looked at together and one of the key things we did was rewrite the research data management policy and make it part of the research code of conduct policy suite. So now what we have is a research data management and primary materials procedure. And with accompanying guidelines, which I've pro provided links for, so when the slides are shared, you should be able to click on those links. And we also added a research data management and indigenous govern data governance um, procedure. So, so that our practices for research data management at UNESQ are aligned with not only FAIR principles, but CARE principles. So the status for that is completed. The second goal we had was to increase research staff awareness and understanding of research data management practice, principle practice. The thing is, it's a long journey um, and the reality is it's a change that's going to happen over time. So we acknowledge that we're at the be kind of like we're somewhere on that journey. So we're probably not at the beginning because we've already made some progress, but I think we're far away from completing everything. So what we've done is developed training materials that can be used to increase staff awareness. So research staff, as well as research support staff, um, some of the outcomes from that was we've delivered over 20 sessions, and I'd like to acknowledge Ade, Dr. Ade Wui, who is with us today, uh, part of my team. So he has done quite a bit of the sessions delivery to over 150 researchers at UNESQ and other Queensland universities. So the sessions we've, or the courses we developed, we opened up, and any university that's interested to use them we're happy to share. So we've shared with the Queensland universities and what we do is we have a uh, making your research data fair um, course. We also have one on making your research um, reproducible session or course. And we also have a um, data management course. So the course design is completed. So updated to align with all the new principles and the, the sessions are ongoing. So we deliver these sessions monthly um, and again online. The third project goal was to increase fair and care enabled research data sets. So what we did was pull in from another project that was funded by the ARDC. And the idea was to enrich the data sets by adding 
um, metadata records. So most of the research data sets that we had were developed by researchers before they were aware of the, um, the richness that can be added to data sets to allow them to be reused as well as repurposed. And so what we've done at UNESQ is met with researchers, walked them through um, the missing metadata, and we've been able to register over 40 metadata records. And the aim is to then publish those via data, set, data sites. Then that will also allow those um, data sets that are linked to the metadata records to be more discoverable and potentially publishable. So this is an ongoing piece of work, and we hope that um, this beginnings will develop into a practice that stays with researchers moving forward. The third goal we had was increasing awareness and understanding of research data management principles and practice beyond our university. So there was documentation and publication of a case study on the experiences of implementing institutional underpinnings aligned RDM planning and practice at UNESQ. So we made a presentation at um, C3DIS in 21 and the ARMS 21 conference, and we're writing up an article for journal publications. Um, the other thing I must mention is we've been very active in um, the working groups as a university. So not just the RDMP one, but there's been other working groups for the different elements that have been identified as part of the framework. Now, one of the things that I'd like to share here, which I think is pertinent to this group is some of the work of the IUP has the RDMP element has shifted emphasis uh, um, from the plan to planning, and that's how we've taken it. So our focus is more on the planning and not just the generation of plans. And I can talk to that later in the Q&A if people wanted. Um, so the status of that is ongoing, and we hope that it'll continue to be ongoing because this is something that we would want to see as a practice moving forward that researchers are engaging with. It's not something that you do once and forget, but it's something that you're constantly striving to towards. Then the final piece of work involves um, testing the institutional underpinnings RDMP framework, which has been published because we're moving into phase three, as well as the QT RDMP and, uh, and PM checklist. So what we've done just last week is we got a presentation from QUT on um, the checklist tool and um, really got good engagement from uh, the teams across um, UNESQ. So again, that's early stage progress being made there. And now what I'll do is just uh, wrap up and talk about some of the significant wins, just highlight them really, not go into a lot of detail. So. The policy and procedure for us, we feel was a big win, high level engagement um, across the senior research leadership was huge for us. Um, the progress we're making in the registration of the 40 research data sets, which entail a lot of work. So when you're retrofitting things, you have to go back to contracts, have conversations with um, sometimes third party um, funding agencies, as well as collaborators. So it's easier if you do it right from the get go. But we have historical data sets that we want to salvage as well. And so we, we are doing some of that work where we go back and renegotiate things, get the permission, um, tidy up the ownership and do all of those sorts of things. So we've been sharing and sharing um, as much as we can. So I know, I think I saw Washi from the GRDC here. So I've been sharing um, stuff with him um, and um, the Queensland Unis we've, we've been sharing with as well. We're part of a project called the Agricultural Research Federation Project. So UNESQ, um, one of the flagship areas for our research is agriculture. 
And um, so we've given a fair bit of focus on agricultural data sets as well and agricultural research projects just to enable them to engage in good research data management um, practices that extend to primary materials as well. So um, with that, I come to the close of my presentation and I think I've gone over time, my apologies, but um, I hope this has been meaningful and helpful for everyone attending. Thank you. It has. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, I know I already have some questions. Um, so we will save those to the end and we'll have a, a Q&A for, for everybody to get involved. Um, and so what we might do now is I would like to um, introduce Claire Blankley, uh, who is going to be speaking about mandatory DMPs. Uh, Claire Blankley is the Research Integrity and Governance Advisor at Edith Cowan University in Perth. She provides advice and leads activities to assist the institution and researchers in complying with the responsibilities and principles constituting responsible research conduct. She's worked in research services and support for nine years, preceded by health services and project management roles in the UK. So welcome, Claire. Thanks, Katie, and to John as well. Thank you for the invitation for um, to come talk to you today about what we've been doing at Edith Cowan University. Um, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the custodians of the land on which I'm talking to you from today. That's the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nations and their elders past, present and future. OK, um, I've put my contact details on there and I've also pop them at the, at the slide at the end of the slide deck because I'm, I'm really happy if anybody does want to talk to me afterwards um, that they can contact me and, and carry on the conversation. I'm conscious I do only have limited time to talk to you today about the project that we've done so always happy to talk outside of, of these forums. So to start with today I'm just going to try and briefly cover a little bit of the work that we've done at ECU about mandating data management plans and, and what we've done in this space and, and the work that we've still got to do. I was conscious that Francis used that word journey a few times during his presentation and it just reminded me of that that this is very much a journey so we've made some good achievements but this, there's still a little bit of work to do in this space. So I'll talk to you about what the driver for change was for us and how we've actually, what the mechanism was for, for driving that change. Um, we had a, a phased approach to this work. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what we did in each of those phases and what our DMP process looks like now. A um, little bit on some of the issues that we came up about and future activities. And then a couple of top tips, really, a couple of our main learnings. So to start with, the driver for change for us was really the Australian code. Um, at the very end of 2019, ECU had FTE to work in this space for the very first time in the research integrity space. And one of the first activities that we undertook was a review of the code, a review of all the responsibilities and the priorities within the code, and undertook sort of a self-assessment to say, well, where are we in terms of those responsibilities? Where are the gaps and where are the real high priority, big ticket items that, that we need to look at? Um, and what we came out with after undertaking that assessment was those three areas that you can see on the slide. We needed to look at some research integrity training for our researchers. We needed to look at the mechanism for reporting and how we managed breaches of the code. And we also needed to look very carefully at data management planning and the facilities that we were providing people for the digital storage space. So when we started to have a little bit of a, a deeper dive into this and look at actually where we were and what the critical issues were at that point, in the 12 months prior, there were only 47 data management plans created at our institution. Um, we are a fairly small research institution, but still I think that may be shocking to some of you. It may not be shocking to others of you, but it may be shocking that there was such a limited number of, of DMPs created in that period. Um, we had a Word document at the time, and it wasn't something that we promoted or really encouraged in any structured way. There was also no institutional sort of voice, no 
approach on the digital storage space. It was something that we were fairly silent on. So these were the really sort of critical issues that we needed to address through the project that I'll talk to you about. One of the first things that we did was we knew that we needed a good steering group. And actually this, the steering group that we developed and that we still have in place in, in some form today, was really one of the big wins from this project. And it was one of the reasons why it was so successful, partly because of the composition of this group, which you, you can see there, we had um, a, a champion business owner, we had the library research services team, we had digital services team, research integrity, records, and research community membership. And also we had that sort of, executive champion support through our, our deputy vice chancellor of research caroline finch so it wasn't just the composition of that group that was important but i think it was actually the individuals that that formed that composition um, were all at the stage where because data management had been a sort of fairly siloed experience at ECU up to this point, that everybody was really happy to come together as a group, um, all wanted to achieve the same aims, really wanted to work together and were sort of champions in their, in their own right. So I think getting that composition and membership of that group was really important for us. So the aims of the project that, that we're talking about, we, what we really wanted to achieve was we, we, it was driven by um, the code. So we want, wanted to be able to say that we were compliant with the code in terms of data management. We wanted to increase those DMP completions. Now, we didn't know at the outset whether we would be able to actually mandate DMPs or whether we'd get to a point where they'd be strongly recommended. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that, how, how that panned out throughout the, the course of the project. Um, and we also wanted to provide that sort of clear position on the digital data on that dedicated storage space. So that was what we were looking to achieve. And we, and we did that through two main phases. And they were actually delivered in a fairly short space of time. Um, so from the end of 2019, when we came together, phase one was delivered by March 2020. And that phase included um, a revision to the data management plan questions that we had in that original Word document. And the steering group that we had were, were fairly strong minded that we wanted to sort of streamline what we were actually asking researchers in our DMP and that those questions should be things that either were critical to know or that they triggered something happening. Um, so we were actually quite ruthless, um, you might say, about what we included and what we didn't include in our revised DMP. We moved that to an online form. So that was initially through Microsoft Forms. And this was a, a soft launch, if you like, because this was, there was an optional completion. So at this point, it was all educative. It was all um, raising the profile of data management, data management planning and talking to people about it and really encouraging people to start using this form and start understanding the process. We also introduced a triage process. So this was to look at the DMPs that were submitted and actually make an, an assessment about whether they met our institutional requirements. If there were things of concern in there that we would go talk to the researchers about them, or there may, there may be things in there that needed that sort of technical or records view. So we had this option to sort of triage the information that was coming in. We also provided, we manually created for each project, each research project, we manually created uh, a SharePoint digital storage space. So every project had 24 terabytes of data um, through this centrally provisioned space. And we developed our DMP website and some FAQs. It was sort of fairly quickly after this point in, in that March 2020 time that we knew we could move to a position of actually rather than an optional and a soft launch, we could move to a, a place of mandating DMPs. So the second phase to the project, which was delivered 
then in September of that year was that we moved that online Microsoft form into our research ethics system. Now, I'll give you a little bit of an overview at this point, but I'll also talk to you about it in the next slide. So the ethics system that we have at ECU is, is um, developed in-house and it was developed through a number of Microsoft 365 products. So it uses SharePoint, it uses Flow, it uses Power BI's. Um, and all research at ECU has to be tested through an initial checklist. And that checklist really determines the level of review that is undertaken. So that may be full, full ethics application is needed or it may be exempt from ethics review, or it could be a reciprocal approval. Obviously, if full ethics review is needed, it then would tip researchers into the application form and they would continue with that. How we managed to, in, to work the system to sort of integrate the DMP process was that no matter what type of research you're conducting, whether it's animal, whether it's human, whether it's neither of those things, you would go to the next stage, which was to create the DMP as part of that application process. So for those researchers that were dealing with human research, the DMP would be one tab of your ethics application. For those researchers that weren't dealing with human research, you would just do that standalone DMP. And it really meant that we knew we were capturing as much as we can ever know that we're capturing um, all research projects that are undertaken as ECU because we have this out of scope and exempt and reciprocal process all through that same that same application form. The other things that we achieved through the second phase of the activities was the automatic creation of that digital storage space. So we moved that from a manual to an automated process and we revised our data management guidelines. We have a principle based policy system at ECU, so we don't have specific um, data management policy, but we have guidelines that are underpin that, that overarching policy. So they were the two phases of the project. So that, that process itself evolved to sort of really how I've just described it for you, that all research conducted should be first be tested through that checklist process to determine if the ethical review is required and whether or not it's required, a, a, a DMP will then be created within that system for researchers to respond to those questions. If um, there is a, for example, an old study that already had ethics in place, we still have a mechanism to create a separate DMP. So this for us meant that not only were we capturing new studies and moving forwards into the future, but we also had an opportunity to really talk about people talk to people about um, the studies that were either ongoing or, or due to be completed. Um, and on completion of that DMP, the system then creates that digital storage space in SharePoint. That also has a Teams interface, which is really helpful then when it comes to you know, managing external collaborators and actually collaborating in that space as well. Um, through the triage service and, and again through some flows that we've set up, we've also got automatic notifications in there to, the, to IT, to the library, to the records team. If there's any sort of non-standard requests or specific issues that researchers have flagged within that DMP, so that will automatically go off to those teams to address. Some of the issues that we came up against and will be um, common to most of you, I'm sure, was a cultural change element. Um, for us, having that two stage approach really helped because during phase one, we really were allowed to sort of raise the profile and start talking to people about data management plans. Um, so by the time it came to the fact that they were integrated then into the ethics system, it was uh, a conversation that was more common. We sort of managed to, you know, use that as an educative soft launch process. Um, something else that we came up against that we haven't really yet managed to find a solution for, so it's something we're still working on, 
is how that works for HDRs. And that's because they automatically have a, a Teams site created for them as soon as they enroll, which manages their candidature. We then create a separate site to manage their research data. So we, we still haven't yet managed to merge those two. So that's, that's something that we're still working on. Future activities in this space, we are looking to audit what's happening. So we're providing people now with that digital storage space. Um, and, th and that's obviously for standard research, you know, for people that are dealing with within that 24 terabytes of data sort of size and don't have any specific technical requirements. Um, if they do, then obviously we need to have conversations with them. Um, but we do want to look at an audit. So are people using what they're provided and how well is that used? We're also involved in one of the institutional underpinnings projects, which is um, more around sort of open data. And that's something that our library services team are leading. And we are also sort of mid development of a research technology catalog. Um, the sort of technology and software that researchers use is, is often something that we get questions about. So we wanted a, a product really that we can promote where people can see uh, what software and what technology is easy to use being through a due diligence process with. And if something's not on that catalog that you want to use, then give them the mechanism to go through that process. So they're just a couple of things that we're looking at doing in the future. Um, really, the things that worked for us, as I, as I mentioned, was that, that steering group, having that group set up to deliver the change and really to drive that change was really key. The composition and membership of the group and having that business owner who was really the leader the, championing that change and also the executive champion. Um, it, uh, the other thing is that that mechanism for delivering mandated DMPs. At ECU, we had a really good option for that because, because our ethics system is in-house, we have the opportunity to develop that as we need to, and we could do that to incorporate that the management of, of DMPs in there. Um, and there's also the, the benefit to the researchers, something that we were really conscious about and that we actually really love about the new process is and, and I know it will be familiar to, to a, a number of you um, the complaint of dealing with a number of institutional processes and a number of separate institutional systems and the fact that we could actually integrate data management plans into a system that already exists a system that researchers are used to dealing with so we're not asking them to undertake a separate process was a real win for us um, and I've sort of mentioned that in the, you know, consideration of how you'd manage that that cultural change. That's the covert completion bit. And I, and I think covert's probably not a great word, but um, you're almost undertaking the completion of your DMP without even thinking about it, without having to actively and consciously go and do it. You're undertaking your ethics and you're doing it at the same time. Um, and those other things that helped us were definitely like the, the educational aspect and that that phased approach. So hopefully I've not gone over time and that's given you a little bit of a flavour about what we've done at ECU and how we've managed to move that agenda along. And I think, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that the journey element of it, and it is absolutely a journey for us and we're still learning and we've still got issues that we are dealing with and obviously resourcing implications is a big part of that as well there's a huge amount of work to do in this space and only a, a limited resource um, but quite happy to take questions later and quite happy to take um, comments or questions offline if you do want to contact me I'm completely happy for that yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Claire. We've definitely had some questions come up in the chat, um, so we'll we'll come to those um, after our next talk. And I'm, I'll certainly, well, in fact, I've passed on a message to one of our ethics people about your internal ethics system. So, um, yeah, we might be interested in having a look at that. We'll see what happens. Mm. Um, so I will um, introduce now my our next speaker. Um, who is Jackie Stevens. 
um, and Jackie is the Manager of Library Research Services at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, Fremantle campus. She leads a small team of senior librarians and has responsibilities for research related initiatives, including managing the institutional repository, as well as teaching and learning. Since assuming this role, her interest in research data management has grown and the knowledge she has accumulated led to her taking the lead on a university wide project in 2021 to implement foundational infrastructure for research data management, including setting up a data management planning tool. So Jackie, over to you. Thanks very much, Katie. Thanks very much, John, for inviting me along today. You'll have to excuse my voice. I'm just I just recovered from COVID, <laughs> so I'm still a bit raspy. <laughs> I'm back in the office though. No, uh, no um, terrible effects of uh, our long lasting. Hopefully, fingers crossed. So I'd just like to begin uh, before I start uh, acknowledging uh, the country on which we are um, standing today, or, or the, our Notre Dame campus indeed are, are located. So we're proud to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which our university sits. And we acknowledge that the Fremantle campus is located on Wajak country, our Broome campus on Yaru country, and the Sydney campus on Kadigal country. So today's session um, I've been invited to speak about is um, uh, about RAID, our taking on board the RAID. And it's been uh, a little bit of a process, um, learning um, and a realisation aspect, I think, that um, through the, me telling the story today, you'll realise that perhaps we're not in the place we should have been, but nevertheless, it's, it is a journey as everybody else has, has talked about today. Um, and we are looking forward to what, what um, utilising the RAID holds for us in the future. So we're just going to look about at today at what, what is a RAID, why use a RAID, and how does Notre Dame use the RAID as well in particular. And I don't know how many of you are um, familiar with a RAID, uh, but it is a research act activity ID and <clears throat> it is a persistent um, identify, identifier for research projects. Um, the RAID acts as a container for research project activities by collecting identifiers for people, publications, instruments and institutions that are involved. A RAID handle looks like this and is minted by the RAID web interface, and in our, in our case, or an API, if you have the means to do so. So the RAID is owned and offered as a service by the ARDC, and that is where we came into contact with it in the initial stages, the promotion at, at ARDC events of the RAID um, and its use. But this story really began some years ago um, mentions uh, at time to time at various conferences, in meetings, usually in the company of um, the ARDC people, oops, beg your pardon, um, uh, often mentioned by Keith Russell. He seemed to be on a crusade for it at some point, including at our raid, at our RISE workshop. Um, the idea of it appealed to me but it was not really a priority at the time for Notre Dame. And there were too many other RDM hurdles to jump through. And I thought it was something really for other universities, better, better established RDM infrastructures to implement rather than us at our small university. But very like uh, the journey that Claire was describing earlier, uh, our journey through um, offering better research data management infrastructure was prompted by the change of code in 2018. And we also implemented um, a quick bit of a quick turnaround about our research uh, uh, data management practices and our infrastructure. So last year, eventually, um, when our foundational RDM infrastructure project was running and we were going through the um, pains of putting the structure of our own instance uh, of the Redbox 2.0 management plan, data management plan together, it occurred to me that it was the perfect opportunity to add the RAID. It was a perfect, it, it already incorporated other um, uh, PIDs, so we had the ORCID embedded into it, and we um, are considering at the moment uh, popping in a couple of other RAIDs, uh, PIDs, I mean, um, as well. So the RAID and the ORCID um, persistent identifiers were our in, in, in 
the initial um, persistent identifiers that we did incorporate. Um, the impetus for it was that I had long been wanting to, to have some sort of mechanism within the university for more effectively tracking um, projects and funders in particular, which uh, we had no means through our um, research management system uh, to track. We didn't have any, any other methods or mechanisms to track um, what activity was going on, whether we could see the, 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 the research that was being conducted at the university outside that that was uh, that had ethics applications. Um, so it was very difficult for everybody really to see and track um, the activity. So in our initial investigations of QCIF the, um, and their red box uh, tool for data management planning, um, they had showcased a graphic in their sales pitch uh, to show potential integrations and RAID was one of those. So it all sort of started to come together and, uh, and I thought that it was all going to be terribly easy. So we integrated the RAID field we knew that we, we couldn't initially get um, an API set up in the short space of time that we, we had uh, devoted to the implementation of the research data management infrastructure. So we knew it would also be a manual creation. Um, but I'm going to show you in a moment how it looks in, um, in, a, in our actual DMP and show you how we've managed that and implemented a couple of other processes in the meantime to support uh, hopefully the RAID awareness and use of it across the university. So <clears throat> why did we use it? We didn't have a university-wide identifier at the university at all. So there was no accession number, as it were, in our um, in IRMA, which is our research management system. Um, there were no other um, numbers that we used to consistently track those research connections. So. For example, you know, the grant number is, is one that's, uh, that's held to be um, a, a, a tracker in the systems, both internal and out external, but it didn't connect with anything else. So we were, we were really struggling with using uh, any identifier at all at the university. And so RAID for us was um, the opportunity to embed this. Um, the RAID tool was an opportunity to instigate a system using an internationally recognized persistent identifier as well. We could see that the, there was potential um, to be integrated in, in hopefully the near future into systems, into applications, funding, uh, publication, uh, publishers sites and things like that. So uh, it was free to implement. So cost come, came into it for us as well. It's uh, obviously the resourcing is the element that does cost money. Um, and that's not just human resourcing because we manually uh, we, we manually mint the RAID handle, but also making sure that our uh, systems uh, had some form of integration as well, so that the RAID could be seamlessly integrated into those systems too. And that, that the development of that obviously does cost money. We started small and we, we do intend to grow uh, over time. Like, like others, uh, like ECU, for example, as Claire explained, we are a small research institution. And so uh, we had the opportunity really for, um, for use at the university that would, would grow with us, grow with our research uh, culture, with our new um, perspective, as it were, on research. And certainly, you know, there were opportunities in that. So rather than being like a large institution where there may be a proliferation of um, project numbers or IDs and, and system IDs and things like that. We didn't have that same um, encumbrance, if you like. So we had, we were starting from ground zero effectively and we were building it and we wanted to be, to slowly initiate um, people into the use of the RAID, what it is, what it does and how it could potentially work and getting used to really the, the, the language around it as well. So it was it was a small um, aspiration that has um, hopefully far reaching consequences in time. So how do we use it? Um, in the re research data management plan, there is a RAID field. Um, we have help text within the RAID field 
that leads to the online RAID request form. So we've developed our own internal form where you apply for a RAID and that obviously aligns with what um, the fields are within the RAID form itself on the RAID website where, the, where it's, it's the, the handle is minted. Library staff um, members uh, manually mint it and then the, the staff member takes that information and edits or takes a handle and edits the research data management plan RAID field and the short title field with RAID and informs the researcher then that they have um, completed that process. Uh, when we, when we um, put the template for the data management plan together, we looked at a template from another university uh, which actually included a short title field and initially we were quite um, puzzled about why you might need a short title field, but we actually have used it to our advantage insofar as we embed the, um, the RAID within that short title field. So it's got the RAID up front and uh, a suffix of a four or a five word um, short title of the project. And it works well because we use it for um, a, folder, a, a, fol a folder name, folder naming convention. Uh, and so we are able to track that folder naming convention and encourage its use across other documentation concerning the project as well. Um, for example, we use it as, or the, the researcher is in, encouraged to use it as the digital storage folder name. And we will also use it as an archiving storage um, folder name. So what does it look like? Well, this is our research data management plan. I'm not sure how clearly you can see that. Um, it's, it's probably quite so small, but this is our research data management plan within Redbox. And we um, have the, the first uh, section of the plan as the project overview. The first field is the project title, and then we go into the RAID. The RAID is the, very, is the second most important, as it were, um, field to complete. You can see I've highlighted the, there's some help text there, which includes some, a link going out to raid.org and uh, for more information, and also to the, uh, the form we have to complete the application or the registration for the, for the RAID for, for library staff. Then, the, then we go come to the short project title, as I mentioned before, and we show an example of what we are expecting the short title to look like and tell the researcher also in the help text what it will be we expect it to be looking uh, to be used for. This is the RAID website, um, basically the web interface, and we mint the RAIDs by coming in here. We click on create in the top right hand corner and manu manually create that RAID in this form. And it's a very, very simple form. Um, so it really only takes, we were concerned, well, our IT staff were concerned that um, there would be, there would be privacy concerns around completing this form and that it, it actually, um, it prevented the, this particular, particular part of the project from going forward for quite some time until they were quite satisfied that the privacy was not going to be compromised. So all that is put into the overview is that um, it's the, the title of the project, the owner is the university, the handle is minted automatically, and then um, and a, a description is added, which is in, in put into the form that we uh, request from the, um, to the library, and it's date stamped. And so it's all, uh, some of the um, process is manual, and some of it is automated by the fact that we have a, an account there. Uh, it obviously includes um, creation dates and start dates. That little um, providers, institutions and change ownership elements are other fields that you can potentially change and add, add more information into. It's very, very simple and very straightforward. So when it's completed, you filled out that um, create RAID uh, form, then your RAIDs show in the master database of, of the RAIDs. Uh, all that have been completed. So the one that I put in for this, uh, this example has been added there at the top. You can see um, up front, you can see the handle that's uh, minted for the, for the project and the start and the date that it was actually created. You can see um, all, you've got a view of all your RAIDs or you can ex export, you can um, 
uh, print to PDF if you if you wanted to, and you can um, obviously interrogate the data as you need to. What does it then look like in our back in our data management plan? We, as mentioned, we added into the RAID field, so you can see the the RAID handle that is minted there, um, with a, with the help text above, and in the short project title, that's an example of one of our, our RAID handles as well being put in as a short project title. So the challenges we've met to date, um, we currently only use it within Redbox 2.0. It's uh, you know great aspirations, as I mentioned, um, in making it a ubiquitous project activity um, or project ID across the university. Um, like ECU did, we had a fantastic uh, team for the, um, the infrastructure to be uh, created and, and um, rolled out. Um, but unfortunately, we have um, some reluctance with new people in the research office to use it in their research, um, man uh, research management system um, if there is no API and the API is a bit slow in coming, um, they have to be created. Redbox doesn't currently have a, an API, so that will have to be built. Um, the other reluctance from the research office uh, staff is that um, not only is there no API that to feed it straight into the RMS, but also they're a bit concerned about um, PIDs in general. They are, I think, um, just a little bit wary that, for example, the grid uh, uh, Consistent identifier for institutions has really changed, uh, recently changed over to the RAW, the ROR uh, persistent identifier. And they're concerned that apart from ORCID, which seems to be fairly established, that any of these IDs may very well change uh, in coming years. And we don't want to necessarily set a lot of store by using them. So these are real challenges that we're, we're grappling with. Different people come in, have different opinions, different takes on the benefits um, of of these uh, elements and uh, the, you know the original team thought was a, a fantastic um, boon to the process. Uh, the other one of the other challenges that we have is that we have we are relying on the manual minting in, in um, uh, obviously in ab absence of an API but that's not too onerous. We're not getting a heck of a lot of um, applications. We're certainly not getting you know, we're not flooded at, on a daily basis by applications. It's a, it's a very manageable uh, rate at this point in time. And I'll show you very quickly a couple of slides with statistics. That, that, that would be great. I might just interrupt Jackie, just to let, let you know that we we may very well have some people who need to, to, go. Who yeah. need yes. to head off right. to other things. We'll go um, the, the slides, the, um, the other slides then. And no. we would love to open it up to some people to have some uh, some questions, um, and I understand if other people need to head off to other things. And, and I, I really do hate jumping in and interrupting people. But um, uh, if yeah. for those of you who want to, who would like to stay on for a bit longer, um, we we'd love to just see the the wrap up of um, Jackie's talk. And then we'll have some questions. Well, I'll, I'll wrap up there. I'm I'm all fine. Um, you just to just to really I guess mention that um, we've had uh in a hundred with 117 applications for or, or the D, the data management plan submissions, we've only had 81, and that is another challenge um to that have applied for raids. So we only have uh, a certain percentage out of that complete total, although the vast majority have applied for a raid. So we're, we are gaining momentum and uh, we have mechanisms to, to, to go back to those people who haven't applied for a raid to, to um, request one. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it at that.